Well, um, welcome everyone to our latest episode of the Guardians of the Flame podcast. Um, it's a real privilege to be uh, in this space. We're in a Benedictine monastery. Uh, actually, it's recently became an abbey, um, just about two miles up the road from the village of Ross Trevor, right on the Irish border in South D County Down. Uh, and I'm really privileged to be interviewing today Podrigin Neulagon. Um, and uh, you're going to hear a bit more about Podrigin and her, her life and her music. Um, maybe as a way of introducing, I'll just say um, I, I first heard you sing and had a conversation with you probably three years ago when I think you were getting a, uh, maybe a Lifetime Achievement Award at Fiddler's Green with Shay Healy. And uh, I remember hearing you sing and you'd, you had kind of restored this ancient song and you sang it beautifully. And, uh, and I remember chatting to you afterwards and you th said that you would love to sing in the monastery. And I thought to myself, one day I have to interview Podrigine in the Benedictine monastery up the road and I have to hear you sing here. So it's a real privilege to have you here, Podrigin. You're, you've had a, you know, an esteemed, a real storied life and career in music and art and creativity. And um, yeah, you, you make this country more beautiful by being here. So Thank you very much, Johnny. Yeah, it's great to be here with you. I wonder, um, many of the people listening, um, many will, will know who you are and will have heard your music, but many won't have, particularly those who are coming from outside of Ireland. Um, can you tell us a bit about your roots? Um, the other day, my wife and I were watching a, an American TV show, and at one point the character in it broke down in tears and said to the, this other person, my roots are bad. Um, you've obviously got roots, and roots in, in the land, roots in culture and music. Can you tell me about your roots? Well, I think my roots are good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was born in Ireland and my parents were brought up uh, in English speaking um, and they learned Irish, uh, the Irish language here in Ireland. And this brought us all up speaking Irish. So my first language is Irish or sometimes known as Gaelic. And uh, my father was a singer and loved song and music and learned the songs directly from the oral tradition on the west coast of Ireland. And he passed on a lot of those songs to me and to my brothers and sisters. There were eight of us in the family. We moved from county to county, mainly on the west coast of Ireland, always in English speaking areas. So we were speaking Irish in an English speaking community. Uh, and then we moved to the Oriel region on the east coast of Ireland uh, when I went off to boarding school. And that's the area in which I live at present. I live in the heart of Oriel. Um, it's very near County Down and Rust River. And um, that's where most of my work is. Mm. So, so it was something in, in your tradition, your, your background, your father's background. He wanted to pass on a tradition to you. And then that somehow in you is also the desire to pass on? Well, very much so, but it's, it was very much from love that my mm. father and mother uh, spoke Irish. It wasn't out of any really nationalistic reasons. They really loved the language. The language, it's a very beautiful language, it's a very ancient language. It's very beautiful, to, the sounds in it, uh, very easy to sing in Irish. And um, then I became a singer and I was interested in song and then when I came to live in this area I realized that there was a tremendous memory loss in the area. When the language died as the language of the people, the daily language of the people, with it was lost a lot of memory. Mm. Um, place names, um, traditions, uh, 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 seasonal ritual, festivals, songs, poetry, um, prose and story was all lost with the language. So as a traditional singer, traditional singers tend to speak the, uh, sing the songs of their own area. So as a singer, I start to look for songs from my own area. So then I found material in archives and libraries. And from that, from that point, I started to restore the tradition and bring it back into the oral tradition and pass it on to a next generation. So that's the core of my work. Wow. And you're from kind of County Donegal, it would be, is that your home? Is that what you would say is your no, home? No, my father was from County Louth in Oriel okay. and my mother was from County Armagh. So that is okay. Oriel and I'm living back in that area. Okay. I'm the only one of the whole family who's living in the County Armagh area. Okay. And that's the, my, all my maternal 
uh, people came from County Armagh. Uh, and can you can you pronounce your family name much better than I can? can My you? name is Padrigine, and the the surname is. O'Hulachan, but as a female, <coughs> my surname is Ni Olachan. Okay, wow. It's not easy. Yeah, well, and for those <laughs> listening, you may not know the nuances of of Northern culture, mm. Northern Irish culture. I, I'm a New Zealand immigrant who grew up in a Protestant British environment um, where sadly Irish was seen as um, very foreign, very alien, like you'd be more likely to know about French than you would be about the the kind of the language mm. of the people whose country you're living in. And mm. So, I mean, it's one of the things that I hope from these, from this particular podcast, the, the beauty of Irish, of the language and music kind of comes out of that. Well, there's a tremendous resurgence recently mm. and people are more comfortable about speaking it and learning it and mm. being heard. I remember when I was growing up and if I spoke it on a bus, all the heads would turn. This is mm. even in our own country. Mm -hmm. So that's all changed. With, with the Irish language television and radio stations, mm. it's much more natural and accepted. So uh, it's understandable that people would not be familiar with it. That's yeah. not surprising. Okay. I wonder, I'd love in this interview to hear you sing a, a couple of songs. Um, is there one that we could kind of start with um, that kind of maybe s says something about your roots or about... Uh, well, there's a church over in Armagh called Craigan Church, uh, and it's now a Protestant church, but uh, in the graveyard are Catholics buried and Protestants buried and mm. princes and um, earls mm. and chieftains and um, all different classes, mm. people, artists, poets, harpers, they're all bur buried in this one place. And it's also associated with a local poet called Art McCooey, who mm. um, reputedly went into the tomb uh, where the chieftains were buried, and he composed a song mm. in which he, the, the muse invites him to the land of milk and honey, honey to escape the hardships of life mm. in the 19th, 18th and 19th century. But he says that his love is in the area, so he wants to stay there mm. and be buried in Craig and Graveyard. Mm. So my, I'll give you maybe a verse or two of that okay. and see how I get on. <laughs> And it's an example, too, of traditional Irish mm. unaccompanied singing. Mm. <speaking in Spanish> Beautiful. That's, That's a beautiful. short version of maybe 14 verses. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but with wow. the lockdown, I haven't been singing much, so yeah, yeah. I keep my, my songs wow. very short these wow. days. Um, you said to me before, you see your, your kind of um, vocation really being about two things, restoration of music and also writing your own music. Can, can you describe a little bit of what that look like, the kind of restoration, like obviously you have worked in that field of well, finding old for, music. For me, the greatest shock was when I started to, to research and find material, just how much of what I might describe as community Alzheimer's there was in it, in, in the area. 
um, how much we had forgotten and how much um, that uh, how much spoke of who we were. And even every hillock, every field, every fence had a name, had a meaning, had a story. And that I realised in the Irish-speaking areas on the west coast of, of Ireland, where Irish is still spoken by the community, that all that had still had meaning. The songs had meaning. Uh, the stories had meaning. It, you know, it spoke of who we were, what our traditions were, the celebrations of springtime, ritual celebrations of spring, May, autumn and uh, um, uh, August the, the, and winter at Samhain and Halloween, all had ritual festivals and meaning. All that was lost. All of it was lost. There was a collective Alzheimer's in the community. And when I started to restore the songs, I felt it was very important not only to restore the songs, which meant going to libraries, finding the music, if it was written down, and remarrying it to the lyrics, if I could find them, restoring the song for myself as a singer, internalising it, then recording it for the community. But in that process as well, I felt it was really, really important to tell who were the people who collected the songs, who were the men and women who sang the songs, um, the stories behind the songs. So I published all of that work, everything that I could find about that story, I published it so that the, next, the community in which I live and the next generation would know about it. In other words, their own identity. Most of the young people and the singers were looking to the west coast of Ireland for material. Unbeknownst to them, it was on their own do doorstep. Mm. So I think f f the feedback that I have got from all that work is that people feel stronger in their own identity, in their own community, and they are singing the songs. There's a whole new generation of people singing the songs that I restored. Mm. Uh, mainly due to one singer who's a teacher in the community, who's teaching in a school, so she's teaching the material to the young people. Mm. Even though the material is very adult, mm. there are special classes after school. So the, her commitment to, to carry on, pass on the material that I have restored mm. is invaluable to the work that I'm doing. So basically, it's the, when you think of how, what it means to us for family members to have lost their memory due to Alzheimer's mm. or in nursing homes. Mm. That gives you some idea of what a, what a community can lose mm. yeah. in relation to their own traditions that had been passed down mm. by their mothers, grandmothers, grandfathers, mm. great-great-grandfathers. Mm. And while I was also doing the work, I felt a strong sense from the ancestors that they wanted to be remembered. Mm that they, you know, I could feel it. Um, it's very hard to explain this to people. I could feel them almost sitting on my shoulder saying, don't forget me, R remember me as well. So that I told their story. And there were some of the people that, from whom songs and stories and material were collected from who could not read nor write academically, but who carried a thousand lines of sophisticated poetry on the tips of their tongue. Mm. And that was written down. And inasmuch as that they wanted the material to be written down by collectors, say, 100 years ago or 150 years ago, they wanted to be remembered because they understood the jewels and the priceless material that they had. So it's not only from an artistic point of view, but it's from a sense of duty to humanity, mm. to our own humanity, that mm. this material is re recorded. Mm. I suppose when we reflect on the history of Ireland, particularly the last 500 years, we've seen, um, you, we can't deny the influence of, of, a, of a power of Britain, of England, um, at times, you know, banning the use of, of the harp or banning the Irish language. And, and then just modern secular Ireland, kind of people losing memory of songs, of their language, losing perspective. When you kind of envision the future, uh, a beautiful future, what, would it, what do you think Ireland would look like, you know, in terms of that understanding of culture and language and music and art? I think, I think, I feel that the work I do gives a community confidence. Mm. 
And m what I would wish for the country is that sense of confidence in who they are themselves. Mm. So that you can be many things at once. You can be an English speaker, you can be an Irish speaker, you can be a Shannos or traditional singer, or you can be singing contemporary songs. You mm. can be rest restoring old material, or you can be writing new material. Mm. You can dance at a disco, or you can go out and do mm. Shannos traditional dancing mm. in your own community and in your own families. That's mm. what I would wish. It's to do with confidence. Mm. And I think in post-colonial times in our own country, I think there was a real serious lack of esteem and worth and confidence mm. in us as, as Irish people. I think we're regaining it, and my hope is that that new sense of self-worth, esteem mm. and confidence would ring true. Mm. And with that goes respect for other people's tradition. Mm. When you respect your own tradition and you're confident mm. in your own, you will most certainly will respect mm. other people who bring their traditions into this country. Mm. And that's fair, that, that kind of principle of respecting other traditions and uh, can can transcend the, the island of Ireland. I mean, mm. you can see that in as far away as Australia to North America, mm. South America. Um, uh, when I saw you sing three years ago, you had released some music that was a kind of, res you had restored many monastic songs. Um, can you t tell us about that kind of project and then maybe a... Well, I was a uh, singer in residence in the Seamus Heaney Centre School of Poetry in Queen's University, Belfast, for many years. And I was very blessed to be there with many wonderful poets, including a good friend of mine, Kieran Carson, who's since died. And um, they, he and Seamus Heaney and other poets used to translate uh, poems from the monastic tradition. They were the earliest uh, vernacular poems in, in, in Europe. Uh, and the poems, the, the, the monks who transcribed the great manuscripts um, used to write out of boredom, I'm sure, or maybe moments of inspiration, write little poems on the margins of the, the great manuscripts. Mm. Uh, and sometimes it would be an observation on nature or it would be a feeling. Um, and um, Kieran Carson and Seamus Heaney translated some of the poems and I felt that it was an opportune time for me to maybe set some of these poems in their original Irish from the 9th century and the 11th century uh, with translations by Kieran Carson and Seamus Heaney. So that was the, the work that you're referring to. The poems are very, very compact, very true, uh, written syllabically, sometimes maybe just 24 syllables in each, very, very short poems, but with a very strong message. Uh, so I recorded that album of material in Songs of the Scribe CD uh, with translations by Kieran and Seamus and some of my own translations as well. Mm. Is there one that you would be willing to sing for us that it kind of stands out to you? Well, it's interesting. I'll sing one that was translated by Seamus Heaney. Um, you know, one of our native uh, saints here is a man called Colm Killa who was from Donegal, and he was in exile on the Isle of Iona in, in Scotland. And there are some poems attributed to him. He may not have written them, but they're attributed to him. And Seamus Heaney translated three of them and published in his last collection, Human Chain. And one of them talks about, um, again, it's very, very brief. And uh, it's, I think it's ninth century. And he, or it was transcribed in the great books in, in the ninth century, and it's about Keir, uh, um, Colm Killa, who will never see Ireland again because he's in self-exile. Mm. So I'll sing the original Irish and Seamus Heaney's translation. Mm. Noch an Towards Ireland, a grey eye will look back, but not see. Fair 
Noch ein Eckbeier Moha für Uhren nach dem And in a sense, uh, Colum Killer oh, is the patron saint of emigrants mm. because so many Irish people left Ireland for the States, New Zealand, mm -hmm. Australia, and mm. would never see the Irish men or women again. Mm. In much um, uh, of kind of when I've read ancient poetry, songs, there's an uh, of, from the Celts, there's this obvious observation of beauty in nature. Um, we've just we're more than ever aware of the 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 environment we live in, the earth, the uh, uh, ecology. What what do you think it is? What, what was it in the that kind of Irish? psyche that kind of made them appreciate um, landscape and beauty in such a way? I think it's an early awareness of unity consciousness, which mm. we're all seeking mm. at the moment. It's a very mm. buzzword, isn't it? Mm. Unity consciousness. Mm. And I think it's that great of, uh, observation that what they were nature and nature was mm. them. They were mm. at one with nature. Of course, there was a great dependence on nature. Their, their, their sustenance was nature. Their inspiration was nature. Um, there are many poems about birds. Cat, Pongerbon is a famous one. I recorded that in Songs of the Scribe. Uh, the birds, um, the birds were messengers from the divine. Um, so for me, it was that sense of being at one with. And of course, in, tho in those times, uh, sp certainly the monks. See, the, most of what the material we have is transcribed by the monks because they were the learned ones. They were the ones who, who were able to write down material. So we're dependent on poems from that area to have been transcribed by them or been composed by them. So they reflect the lives, the monastic life at that time. And there were some women who wrote as well. Leodon is one of them. And I recorded a song of hers as well, her love for the monk Curraher. So they fell in love too. <laughs> So I think their life was very, very close to nature. When you think of the, I've been to Skellig Michael mm -hmm. on, off the coast of, of uh, Kerry, mm -hmm. and um, I saw where the monks lived in their beehive stone mm. huts. I mean, that mm. is at one with nature, mm. you know. For those listening, um, Skellig Michael was made famous by Star Wars in the... <laughs> Unfortunately. In the, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, they, should never have happened. Yeah, it's the too sacred spaceship space. came flying through yeah. and it landed there, but... Um, it's a very special place. Yeah. Um, and I think as I've, again, listened and learned about the early roots of Celtic Christianity, there seemed to be... Um, something much more beautiful than than what sometimes has become Christianity. And you were saying being at one with nature. I mean, that, that was early Celtic kind of Christian idea, the sense of oneness. Whereas nowadays it's common, not just people of faith, but all kinds of people sometimes to view the earth as something to subdue, to dominate, to have dominion over, instead of seeing it as something that we're interdependent with. Well, the catechism that I learned as a child, the Catholic Church catechism, I remember the line that animals, nature, was there for man's use and benefit. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a, a license to do what you liked with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not blaming the church for that, mm -hmm. but it certainly was a deep mm -hmm. programming in the consciousness mm -hmm. of people that it was for man's use and benefit. Mm -hmm. In as much as that we are all here mm -hmm. for each other's use and benefit, it's not the ideal usage of words in relation to interdependence mm -hmm. and nurturing and support mm -hmm. and kindness and mm -hmm. compassion. Mm -hmm. So that um, something went astray there. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. And uh, yeah, Mother Teresa, I think, said, you know, if we're in conflict, it's because we've forgotten it, that we belong to each other. And um, maybe if we're in conflict with the earth, it's, we've forgotten that we belong to it somehow. I yeah. think I think so. I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. If there's not a deep respect for nature, for the helplessness mm -hmm. of either children or older people, mm -hmm. um, um, sick people and animals mm -hmm. and nature, I think we're on the wrong track. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's to do with self-esteem, self-worth, mm. 
and confidence when we have self-esteem. I think th I think they generally there's a there's a real awareness now of how mu how essential it is that we love ourselves. Mm. And when I was growing up, you know, we were also taught to love our neighbours as ourselves. We mm. were never ever guided or taught about how you loved yourself. Mm. And in fact, it reflected almost like a weakness or something that was mm. not uh, that was frowned on if you loved yourself. Mm. But in a sense now, it's like tradition and our own traditions and our own communities is loving our own and loving ourselves is more likely that we will respect and show compassion to others. Mm. I um, think. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so we can't um, escape the fact that we're actually in a church right now. Um, and the, the landscape of Irish Christianity is changing and really has changed drastically in the last few decades. And I'd love to hear your reflections on, um, on faith and, and church um, as, as someone who has restored ancient Christian songs, but has also seen the good, bad and the ugly um, of it. Um, what do you, when you sit in a church, what's your reflection of that means to you? I see the work that I do on the restora restoration of the monastic material as well as the traditional song material um, as being separate in a sense from the institution of the church in which I was, the Catholic church in which I was brought up. Um, there's a tremendous shift in the relation between the people and the institution of the church in Ireland. For n many years there's a great sadness and disappointment and a sense of letdown um, in it due to the whole story of child abuse. Um, and I think there's certainly the, the landscape has changed with the lockdown and the, the COVID lockdown, that people were all, many people, not all of course, um, were happy to have an excuse maybe not to go to church, mm. that, that it was almost fulfilling a certain program in their lives or conditioning, that they, something they'd always done. I heard people who went diligently to ch church every Sunday who said, since the lockdown, I don't feel I need to go there mm. anymore. So people are looking towards themselves and towards um, nature mm. um, for the presence of the divine mm. and an art, of course. Mm. So it, it, this, where we are at the moment is sort of an exception for me in that there's a certain purity and energy in this church that appeals to me very much. Mm. I sense it as soon as I come in. I think it's to do with the, the men who inhabit this place mm. and the constant singing that they do daily purifies this space. Mm. And mm. it's so it's, you know, you could talk for, at, for a long time mm. about where the church is, where it's going, what mm. our relationship. The essence is mm. that, that we seek love from within and a sense of divine, direct connection with divine through our own heart. Mm. I certainly understand what you mean about the, this particular place. The Benedictine monks here are, I think, really remarkable uh, men who have created a, an environment of hospitality. Um, and beauty, and as you said, singing every day, Gregorian chanting, and um, uh, and y you can't help but feel it somehow it does mm. make the air the air pure. It does um, because energy is a buzz buzzword, but it does affect mm. the energy energy mm. and the vibration of a space. Mm. And one of the happiest memories I had was bringing my mother here. She's she, before she died um, on a Sunday, and we'd walk up to the front row and sit on it, and she she just absolutely loved the space, the singing. Mm. And for me as a daughter, I look back and it's one of the things mm. I got right. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it was a very pleasant experience because she had been to school where the nuns taught Gregorian chant, as I had been. Mm. So that it was a, a wonderful experience for her. Mm. And just kind of coming, just before I move on from that kind of whole the church kind of conversation, you had written, was it a song? Or was, you referenced black candles. Are you talking to, yes, what was that the, the, as well as I, as well as restoring work and singing as a traditional singer, I am a singer-songwriter in Irish, mm. and I've recorded an album of songs in Irish, new compositions, and one of them was called Free Spirit, and it mm. was that longing to connect with the divine in nature, 
And one of the lines I remember is, was to take me from this dark place of, um, from this cold place of darkened candles or black candles mm -hmm. since they, they betrayed the message of love. Mm -hmm. And to me, child abuse was a, a deep betrayal of the message of love mm -hmm. of Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. A very, very, very deep betrayal. Mm. And what was it you were saying to me about um, reading about uh, some words of Jesus? You know, it's better to, if uh, better, anyone that harms a, a little child, it's better they have a millstone. Yes, I remember as a child, <laughs> um, there were two messages in, in the teaching of religion in school, and one of them that appealed to me, and one of them was Christ saying that anybody who um, <clears throat> damaged the innocence of a child should have a millstone thrown around their mm. neck very mm. extreme mind you mm. and the other one was to bring the children to him mm. and I felt gosh there is somebody on our side <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's that you know it's that innocence of a child any of us who interact with, with, with children mm. and who've had children mm. and I've taught children understand the, the deep damage not just to, to mm. them but to community to mm. the body of humanity Mm. It's a very, very deep wound, and it mm. still needs a lot of healing. Mm. And so, uh, today, what what are you um, busy with? What is, what's on your horizon, or what's what's your kind of passion right now? Well, I'm working on another album of new compositions in Irish, restoring and resurrecting the memory of the goddesses in Ireland mm. who had been forgotten. Uh, Bridget is the great mother goddess and all the other goddesses. I'm also working, I've been commissioned to write a song about Colum Killa, the, the saint who mm. went into exile or the patron saint of emigrants. Mm. And I am working on that in the studio. That's a big, intensive body of work. Mm. So there'll be 11 new songs and hand in hand, I'm always working on the restoration of the tradition. Mm. So I swing, it's like a seesaw, mm. my own creative, um, uh, newly written, material and compositions. So at this stage, I think I've written about maybe 40, 50 songs mm -hmm. and composed a lot of airs to poems and bardic poems and monastic poems and contemporary mm -hmm. poems. So my work is very much creative and new material and the old material as well. Mm. And is there something about that work on kind of um, on uncovering an understanding of goddesses or is there something about that that is meaningful for us to kind of engage with in the modern world of today? Well, I, I go to India quite a bit and mm. um, I'm very fond of the country and I feel that I might have been re in, in one incar incarnation mm. that I was living <laughs> in India. And uh, I remember being there one time at a concert and some of the Indian musicians asked me about the goddesses in Ireland mm. because India has hundreds and hundreds of goddesses in Ireland and it made me think that all I could think of was Bridget mm -hmm. so it made me think gosh I've come across the names but there's no awareness of them mm -hmm. and really the goddesses are just aspects of our own humanity you know mm -hmm. archetypal aspects of our mm -hmm. of our own nature and humanity so by honoring them we're honoring ourselves mm -hmm. it's back to the same thing mm -hmm. constant honoring of what's mm -hmm. human in us what, and uh, elevating it, you know. Can you? What would that mean? What does that um, uh, kind of their expressions of something that's in us already? Like, what would an example well, be? What would Bridget be? For Br Bridget would be compassion. Mm. She's the goddess of the the of art, mm. of blacksmithing, metalworking, creativity, mm. of fire, um, and uh, compassion. Mm. So, honoring her, you know, recognizes those traits, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. I mean, you could, there, there are many books written about Bridget and many more to be written. Mm -hmm. So I'm just s surfing the, mm -hmm. the, the, the knowledge about her, but in song. But the material was received very well and people mm -hmm. want more of it. So, um, of course, there are love songs and lullabies. I composed lull and laments. Mm -hmm. I resurrected the old keen. Mm -hmm. that, had, that died out in our tradition where women uh, expressed the grief and sorrow at funerals to, um, to alleviate the pain for the chief mourners. Mm. It, it, was a, it was a community service. Mm. And I have sung at a lot of funerals. Mm. In fact, I sang at maybe more funerals than I did mm. at concerts. And I understand that um, service mm. of releasing the grief for people who are holding back on it mm. through the process of singing the sorrow for them. Mm. So the old keen in the Irish tradition was doing that. So I resurrected that and created a new composition around that. And okay. that's on the new album as well. Okay. 
you know, I'm, I'm involved, I've just started, as you know, a, a new job uh, with the Corrymeela community, a mm. well-known Peace and Reconciliation Centre in Ireland. And um, one of the projects that they've been involved in is connecting with a few different organisations, Wave Trauma, which is an organisation that works with victims of the Troubles and Healing Through Remembering. And, um, and the Healing Through Remembering really has been trying to create a day of reflection in in Ireland, particularly in the north, um, where both sides can kind of come together and remember the past and almost uh, lament. So last year there was a service of lament, of, of reflection on the 21st of June. They decided to make it the 21st of June. But not many people have picked up on the idea, I think largely because people just want to move on. You're talking about lament and people just want to move on. They don't want to deal with the past, really. And of course, our two sides sometimes can't agree to on anything, you know. Um, but, I, but it strikes me that as you talk about songs, singing songs and funerals and lament and that the importance of that and the importance in our society of, of being able to um, acknowledge the grief that we've kind of gone through as a society, how do you kind of see the importance of that? And is there a way that we as a society could come together and, and lament? I think it's essential. I think anything that is suppressed will come out in some other way. Mm -hmm. And also, I think sometimes we're afraid of the emotion of it. And that's why the keening of the, the women's keening was suppressed, because the emotion was too naked, too raw, too, mm -hmm. too, too, too um, you know, just raw grief mm -hmm. expressed by women is very, very powerful. By men too, of course, mm. but women were the main keening, keeners in the mm. tradition, and it was suppressed by mm. the churches, mm. mainly the Catholic Church in Ireland. Mm. And so I think it's an, a, absolutely essential. Mm. Um, even Abide With Me sung in a church mm. with meaning and with depth will release grief for people and mm. will let the tears flow. Mm. And that in itself is healing. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be an obscure, ancient, traditional style. It can be just an ordinary hymn. Mm. I sing a, 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 frequently sang a song, Just As I Am. I rewrote an old Protestant hymn called Just As I Am mm. and made it more slow and mournful. And men, I, men would cry at it mm. Mm. as much as women in a, mm. at a funeral. Mm -hmm. um, because it released. So it's absolutely essential. How in a community do you get people to come together and uh, release shared grief it is, is a challenge. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure the way forward. Mm -hmm. Maybe talking about it and then interwoven mm -hmm. by, as you said, a concert mm -hmm. or, or performances mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, art is a fantastic way for releasing mm -hmm. sorrow and feeling and depth of it through po poems, expression mm. and song and music. And the word you use there, keening, what, what does that word? Keening is simply means crying, mm. keen. So it's a word that's now in the English language. Mm. To keen something mm. is to weep or cry it. Mm. And it comes from the Irish called keen, mean cry. Mm. So it, is, it was very much a very, a very significant part of, of the, the, the tradition in Ireland. And why do you think the church would have suppressed women keening? The emotion of woman, I think, they was threatening, uh, was uncomfortable and threatening, mm. too, too raw. Mm. You know, and also mm. there was a certain power in that singing. So mm. it's, for, it's, it's to control. Mm. You know, if you control the woman, the mother, mm. the creator, you're controlling a lot of humanity. Mm. And I mean, that's not, that's, that's well known. That mm. was what was happening in churches mm. throughout, throughout the world. Mm. We're kind of coming to the, towards the end of our conversation. This, uh, of course, is so much, uh, I would love to hear you say and sing. Um, your, your voice sounds really amazing in this uh, environment. Um, I, I wonder just, um, when you reflect on the future, do you, do you look, we're in COVID-19, we're kind of maybe emerging out of it. Um, what do you see the role of music and art is in COVID, a time of isolation and separation from each other? Is, is music in there? Is that part of the healing for the world? It, it, it could be and ought to be. I'm not sure if it was during the COVID um, 
artists were totally lost during the lockdown. Mm. They they were so programmed and many many to perform and to travel and to tr live out of suitcases, and we were all uh, forced to stay put, stay quiet, mm. uh, reflect, meditate. Um, and then there was a movement towards sharing material online, which was, I think, a help to a lot of people. It was also very good for artists to find a way of expressing what they were feeling. I did it myself. I released The Goddess, a, a track to uplift people. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has, it has, it has, it always has a role. It has a role always and always will have a role, the arts and music. How things are developing, I'm very optimistic, it's all going to settle down next year. Mm -hmm. I think we have another mm -hmm. winter of discontent. Mm -hmm. But um, I think next year we will see the light shining through again. Mm. I mean, there's certain magical things happening throughout the world. Uh, there's some awful things happening as well, but I'm very optimistic that we're going to learn some very hard lessons mm. and that we will move forward from mm. that and be the better for it. Mm. Well, Peter Green, you're, you've touched on a lot of things in this conversation, um, music and art and uh, the kind of the indigenous the psyche and culture in Ireland. Um, uh, is there a song that you could sing for us to kind of bring this to an end? Well, I was thinking again, I haven't been singing much, mm -hmm. so my voice is a little bit r rusty, but uh, I, another song, one of the little monastic poems comes to mind as we're sitting here because we're surrounded by trees and bird song. And this one was translated by Kieran Carson, who died there a few years ago. And again, it's from the ninth century. Mm. <laughs> Vom hun trira hun anjen. All around me green wood trees, I hear blackbird verse on high, quivering lines on vellum leaves, bird song pours down from the skies. Over and above the woods, the blue cuckoo chants to me. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. I write well beneath the trees. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, uh, Padrigin and Iolakon, thank you so much for your time and uh, your voice and, and the beauty that you've brought to this space. Um, thanks for your time for this evening. Thank you very much, Johnny. Yeah. Thank you.